Thank you, guys. I want to start not by talking about the book, but by talking about my own social network story. And this story is sort of like a joke. What do voting and shampoo have to do with dying of a broken heart? I guess that's not much of a joke, is it? <laughs> when I was in graduate school, I was obsessed with a classic problem in social science. Why do people vote? Now, a lot of you in the audience are probably thinking, well, you've got it backwards. Isn't the question, why don't people vote? But social scientists, we like to think that people make decisions and they'll choose between A and B. And they'll think about, will I be better off with A or will I be better off with B? And so when we look at an election, like the election that happened in 2000 between Gore and Bush, it was the closest presidential election in US history, decided by about 700 people. Now ask yourself the question, what would have changed if any one of those 700 people had decided not to vote? Nothing would have changed. And so it's a puzzle why anyone, any of those 700 people, or for that matter, any one individual didn't decide, well, there's all these other millions of people voting out there, so why should I bother? And so this problem has puzzled social scientists for a very long time. And I was going to tackle this problem, I was going to solve it, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. And then one night, as I was drifting to sleep, it was about 2 in the morning, I remembered a commercial from the 1970s, a shampoo commercial, where a woman becomes enraptured with her shampoo. And she's so excited about it that she tells two friends, and the screen splits and there are two women. And then they tell two friends, and the screen splits and there are four women, and so on, and so on, and so on. And pretty soon there are 64 women using the shampoo. And it occurred to me that voting, like using shampoo, might be something that spreads in social networks. And that maybe social scientists have gotten it wrong all these years to think of individuals as though we were Robinson Crusoe, each person an island to ourselves. So I told my advisor, Gary King, this, this story about shampoo, and he kind of scratched his head and he was a little bit puzzled about what to do with me. But then the very next day, he went to hear a talk by uh, Nicholas Christakis, my co-author on this book, Connected. Um, and in his talk, Nicholas also described this classic social science problem that kept him up at night. He had worked on this uh, effect called the widower effect. And this is this uh, uh, phenomenon in which one person in a spouse couple um, tends to, to not live as long when their partner dies. And so just for example, our best estimate right now is that when a woman dies, her husband loses about seven years of his life. And when a man dies, the woman loses only about two years of her life. I'll let you speculate on the reasons for the differences. <laughs> but he actually um, was an end-of-care life doctor, um, end-of-life care doctor, and he got a call from a man who was concerned about her wife, uh, concerned about his wife. And his wife was very, very close to the spouse of someone who was dying. And it occurred to him that that he was studying these effects that spread from one person to another, but in fact they ripple through the network from person to person to person. Here was the spouse of a friend of a spouse who was being affected by the original person uh, on, on their deathbed. And so he was very interested in, in trying to figure out whether or not health effects spread in social networks. And my advisor heard this talk and he said, wait a minute, you guys are talking about the same problem. You guys need to meet. And we did, and this book is the result of about seven years of collaboration. And so before I go on from this social network story of my own, I think it's a good idea for us to, to think about you know, what social networks are. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to first of all talk about purpose-driven networks. These are networks that we create in order to achieve some kind of goal. And looking at these simple networks, I think it will be a little bit easier to think about natural human networks. Um, the networks that are formed whenever we make choices independently of one another about who we're going to have a relationship with. Then I'm going to make a somewhat radical claim, and that is that the shape of these social networks has been affected by evolution. And we have some evidence that I'll talk about in the, it's in the book and also in this talk um, for why we think that's the case. Then the reason why we're doing that is because, as everyone knows, we have a new way of thinking about social networks. And Facebook and in MySpace. And in fact, a lot of people, when they hear that our book is about social networks, they think that it's exclusively about Facebook and about MySpace. And our argument is that we've actually always been living in social networks. We've always had friends, we've always had family, and we've always existed in these webs of interconnected networks that are things of beauty. 
and they're so ubiquitous, and their shapes are so regular that one has to wonder how they form and what their purpose is. And finally, after we taking a look at all these things, what I'd like to do is talk about how this newfound understanding of how we live embedded in these social networks is changing our lives. So think about, first of all, the simplest kind of network you can possibly think of. So here in the bookstore, you know, suppose that they wanted you to take all the books from one side of the bookstore to the other. Now one thing that we could do is we could all get up and each of us go grab a book by ourselves and take it over to the other side of the store. Um, it's a little crowded in here tonight and so we'd be bumping into each other and you know, maybe some of us would get lost on the way from one side of the room to the other. Um, so how would we form ourselves to do that a little more efficiently? Well, a classic way that people form themselves to do this is, is the bucket brigade, right? So, so your house is on fire, the river is nearby, you get people in a line with buckets and they pass the buckets back and forth, putting water on the fire. And that way, people who aren't strong enough to carry a bucket from the river, people who might get lost on their way back from the river, are able to contribute to this group effort. And so this is an example where we have circles in these network maps that represent people and lines that represent relationships. And so you can imagine that the person at one end of the line is actually very far from the person at the other end of the line. But we have other kinds of networks as well. For example, the telephone tree. Now, if you're a young member of this audience, you might not know what one of these is. But before the internet, <laughs> when you wanted to get the word out to lots of people in a short period of time about something that was happening, like back east they talk about snow days, trying to tell everybody don't come to school, it's, it's not safe to be on the roads, what they would do is they would have these lists. And you would have a central person who started off the telephone tree who would call two people, and then each of them would call two people, and each of them would call two people, and pretty soon everybody would get the message with a minimum amount of effort by everybody involved. So this is just like the shampoo commercial, right? Except now we want to just warn people about snow days. And the thing about this is that this is an, uh, an artificial way of creating a cascade for one person to create something that's going to affect hundreds, in some cases thousands of other people. Um, if you'll notice, whenever you think about this process, the number of steps it takes you to get from the center of this network all the way out to the edges where everyone is being informed is very small. And this is related to this small world property. You guys have heard of the six degrees of separation or, or maybe the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, <laughs> right? Where you're able to connect people through a series of handshakes or a series of relationships to everyone else in the world in six steps on average. So this is an artificial network that takes advantage of that property, this small world property. And it can also spread bad things as well. And so Bernie Madoff, for example, he was at the center of a network like this. But instead of sending things out, he was bringing money in. And my grandmother, bless her heart, um, she was a fan of Amway for many years. And she thought she was at the center, but I think she was more out on the edges. <laughs> <laughs> um, another network that, that we form with, with great purpose is the military squad. And here what we do is we get small interconnected groups of people to have very close relationships with every other person in the group, all interconnected. And one of the things that social scientists know is that when you have all of these interconnections, it increases the amount of trust in the group. And so when you're in a situation where you never leave a man behind, this could potentially be the best way for you to form a network on purpose. In fact, um, in certain studies of how businesses behave, this is a key component in how we're going to be able to create organizations that utilize these network properties. And so, for example, Brian Uzi has done fantastic work on Broadway musicals in which he's shown that this trust is really important, um, that you really need to have these interconnections between people who are involved in creating something new in order for them to be as creative as they possibly can. But one problem is, is that when they get too interconnected, then they no longer have connections to people outside of their group. And so even though they might have created a blockbuster, so you, you know, I have a picture of Peter Pan up here on the screen, even though they created a blockbuster, um, they may not be able to repeat that in the future because they're not going to have any new ideas. And so there's actually a sweet spot, a Goldilocks point, where you get to use this telephone tree-like property of the small world to get information from other people to maximize creativity, but you also rely on some interconnections to promote as much trust as possible in the group. Um, and so this is you know, one thing that we talk about in the book is, is that you know, in the economy and when we're dealing with issues about you know, how to create money or how to create goods, things that other people will enjoy, these networks that we create are, are critical.